Welcome to Farm 360. This is Leslie Unger, your host today. Thank you for joining us on a Zoom edition to our global outlook with the local view. Of all the institutions the pandemic has shut down, schools seem to face the most pressure to reopen. Everyone from pediatricians to the milkman to uh, working moms to the president have weighed in on when and how to reopen. We can all agree that the consequences of closed or half open schools are vast for those directly involved and for the economy as a whole. The topic is too big for us to tackle in one show. We are going to look at one school district in Northeast Ohio and the creative way they are dealing with all of the potential health repercussions. I want to welcome our three guests. We have Kim Redman, current superintendent of Portage Lakes Career Center and former superintendent in Stark County. We have Chris Cargill, who is represents the innovative manufacturing segment um, that Ohio has always been known for and is still known for. And we have Kathy Pugh, who is both an artist and a middle school art teacher. And um, we're going to navigate um, through this and, um, as I said, the creative way. Now, former Education Secretary Arnie Duncan said, schools are mustering real creativity. And we're going to find out what schools are doing in a, in a school district close to us that is very creative. Kim, I'm going to start with you. Our superintendent is going to be with us for just the first opening minute. So I'm going to direct the first questions to Kim Redman while she is here. Tell us some of the factors from an administrative perspective that go into deciding to reopen, physically not reopen, virtual, open in August, open in September. Tell us some of the factors that go into it from your superintendent perch. Thank you, Leslie. Um, I, I would say that first and foremost, we have to make sure that the health and safety of our students and our staff are our top priority. Um, it always is, but none more now than ever. Um, we have to be flexible and adaptable to the current circumstances that can change tomorrow. Um, quite often I have a meeting with our staff and through a Zoom like this, and I always say, whatever I say today, it can change tomorrow. And, and so with that, um, we believe with all of our heart that our students need to be present. We are a career center and the students choose us because they like to work with their hands and they can't do that as well in a remote setting. We did the best we could in the spring, but um, we are planning to be face-to-face -face as long as we can um, this fall. Does reopen mean the same thing to every school district? No, it does not. No, it does not. We serve four other school districts. They, come, they channel into us and they each are um, doing something a little bit different, but we all, first and foremost, hope to be face-to-face. -face. And then after that, um, families can choose. Some families aren't comfortable starting face-to-face, -face, and that there has to be some freedom and flexibility there for them to choose remote um, until they feel comfortable in coming back to school. What we like to say is that within our programs, our labs cannot be uh, remote all year long in order for students to get what they need to be licensed. Um, but our, our academics can be remote much sooner if that's what we need to do. Does the threat of, of the federal government withholding federal money play into a decision to reopen or not? For, for us in Portage Lakes, it does not. What plays into the decision is the safety and well-being of our students and our faculty. And as long as we have the things in place to make that happen, we're gonna be face-to-face. -face. And um, Kathy and Chris have designed things to help us have a much safer environment than we did in the spring. I have two more questions for you before I let you go. Students are certainly one consideration, as you have mentioned. But there's other considerations. There's the teachers and the bus drivers and the kitchen staff and all of the people that go into a school. Um, 
what are some perspectives that you hear from them? When we met with our um, cafeteria staff, we, we talked about how can we have a grab and go. Um, our school cafeteria is well known for its excellent food. I know you might find that hard to believe, but it is. And so we said, we know yeah, <laughs> we no longer, yes, here we are. We no longer want to be known for our delicious food. It's going to be grab and go and safe. So that's the, you know, the cafeteria. Our custodians are working steadfastly to make sure that our school is sanitized at least three times a day. Um, so their, their behavior and their things that they are having to do has changed and continues to adapt and change. And, and they've been awesome with that. My last question is, you know, as educators, as administrators, you are not taught, I don't think, what to do in a pandemic that happens once every hundred years. So how did you muster, as, as Artie Duncan said, how did you muster the creativity um, to, to just get through a pandemic with no real experience or expertise as no one has in a pandemic? That's correct. There was not a class on how to survive. Um, what I, I think we bring to the table is a belief system that students, children, need to be educated, they need to be socialized, and they need to learn to navigate this unknown world. And, and I believe with all of my heart that educators are the people to do that and to help them do that. So it, it's a belief system. And then reaching out to those who can help you like Kathy and Chris, who have um, really made my job easier and, and to put forth what they are going to talk about um, has caused the, the minds of our parents to certainly be eased with the idea that we can social distance and still be in school. It's interesting, you know, as a communication coach, I say mindset first. And so you're telling me it's the belief system first and then how to, how to get it to come into fruition. True, I mean, I think you have to have a belief system strongly that we can do this, but the mindset of how you get there is, is key, you're correct. Well, thank you. Um, thank you to Kim Redman, uh, current superintendent of Portage Career Center, um, former superintendent of Stark County. Thank you for starting. I know you have to go to a superintendent's meeting. Um, and something might have changed in the 10 minutes that you missed. Um, so I thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Leslie. And thank you, Chris and Kathy. Now I have the um, educator's viewpoint and I have the, the uh, innovation and the manufacturing viewpoint. Um, I'm going to ask a question, and, and both of you might want to weigh in on this. As I said, you know, Arnie Duncan said creativity, mustering real creativity, and, and both of you are responsible, but where and how does creativity come in this equation during the pandemic? Well, for me, as an educator, I knew with everything that was going out that I had to clean surfaces, clean my manipulatives, and be ready for the next class. And my class is one where they will go in and out. I don't travel, they come to me. And I just couldn't figure out how to do it. And then I would see all the plexiglass and I'm like, oh, that's just, you know, more surfaces for me to clean. I said, they need to go with them. And the idea got passed on through uh, a friend of mine who happened to be an architect that knew um, MR Chris and MRO built and uh, that's where my piece came in, but they have a lot of other really cool ideas that make it safer for us to go back to school. So Chris, did you foresee you were going to be a part of a solution in this pandemic? Well, when our core business is typically millwork and fixtures for retailers and restaurants, and in March we went from doing more business than we could handle to no business coming in. And so, you know, some of creativity just comes from necessity and being open to it. And so we started pivoting to rapid response furniture for temporary medical facilities. And then we started working with clients on how to outfit their offices and retail spaces for the COVID um, pandemic. And then when Rod uh, Meadows, our kind of common friend between Kathy and us came and said, hey, we've got this idea. We were already in that mindset of what can we do and where can we go? And we've got a great team of people who are pretty innovative. 
and like new challenges. And behind me, I always see my uh, bull horns, and it's always, what's the next bull that you got to take by the horns and accomplish it? So, so you were uh, in the retail, but not in the education arena. Is that correct? We were in both. The majority of our work was in retail and restaurants, but we do a lot of work with uh, local universities too, like Walsh and Kent and Malone. Okay. So, which one, it's kind of like the chicken and the egg. Did you start just because you had to solve a problem, or did you start because you had to expand your client base? Well, it was, it was, it was both. So, we needed to expand the client base and looking to see what did people need at that point in time. And we just started opening ourselves up and talking to people about what they need and what's going on. And then as they presented what they needed to have done, it all kind of just married together pretty sequentially. But, you know, being open to it and asking the questions to get the conversation started, that's the key. Well, you know, that's funny. That, my, that was my next question. To come up with this product, did you have to do a lot of listening? Yeah, and Kathy, you know, Kathy always says, it was great to have somebody to listen to her, you know, her original ideas. And, you know, it's, with Kathy, it's how do you not listen to her because she's so passionate about teaching and so passionate about saying in this instance, how do we let teachers teach and kids get ready to learn? And then how do we help facilitate that together? So, you know, one of the things that we've heard about in some school systems because of social distancing is to have half the number of kids at a time so that they can be spread out more. But tell us how your solution addresses social distancing and, and um, you know, not a, a mask, but, but staying safer. Oh, it's, it's a clear plastic shield that's foldable and it sits on a mat, which is also plastic. So the shield folds up into a 12 by 18 piece and it fits inside the mat and the kids take it with them. So there are no surfaces to clean. Um, they're safe. They know who has been on the surface that they're on from one class to the next. And for me as a teacher, I'm an art teacher. I can't be six feet away and say, you need to fix this. But I can sit on the other side of that shield and feel safe. Whether and, and when this first started, my district was not requiring masks for the students. For the teachers, yes, but not for the students. And so then I got a little, you know, you get a little worried. You need to have some kind of barrier there because my mask isn't going to catch it all. But that clear, it, it's perfect. It's easy for them, no matter what age, to fold it up and carry it. It was just... MRO Built was just fantastic to work with. And, and Chris already said it. They listened to my idea because I started with poster board and duct tape. And we ended up with a really, really cool solution. Definitely a solution that I can still teach. So is one, of the, one of the interesting things in it is we had lots of different school districts come through. And every day we were putting on little tours of the different things we'd put together. And what was obvious right away is that maybe we had, what, seven different solutions at the original table. Everyone liked the same one. And so it was very clear what was the, probably the best solution for the most uh, circumstances for the kids and the teachers in the classroom. Now, this is something that, what's the youngest age that can carry this around? Well, Louisville is going kindergarten through 12. So a kindergartner can handle this and, and a 12th grader will use this. Yeah. Is Louisville is going every single student. They bought one for every single student. And interestingly, they started saying, we're going to go K through five. And then over time included the middle school and then included the high school. So they started with the young ones and then moved all the way up. I'm going to ask both of you in your different ways to address how, um, and I'll start with you, Kathy, how social distancing itself is not possible in a classroom. So for people that just say, well, you can social distance and wear a mask, how is that not feasible? It's just not. If we did the social distancing, it'd be like remote learning. And I'll be honest with you, it did not work. When we went to it in the spring, a lot of the kids don't log on. 
They can't get their questions answered. There's technology problems. And for me, I do project-based. You need to be there. You need to be right beside them. You need to, to have that one-on-one. -on -one. And I work in an urban, I work in Canton City. Those kids need that contact. They need to be able to see their teacher. They need to be able to hear their teacher. And for some of them, they need to get out of their home. It's not a safe place. And with these dividers, um, it, it provides that. They can do that. Now, Chris, before I ask you, I want to just briefly uh, reintroduce. We're looking at one little part of the pandemic and the huge footprint that it has put on, on education and the ability to reopen with a product that has been built in uh, Canton, Maslin, right around there in, in uh, Northeast Ohio, uh, kind of the brainchild of educators like Kathy Pugh and, um, and then built by a local company, MRI Built, MRO Built, and we're looking at that product today. Um, Chris, so how does this invention address social distancing and the, or the, the lack of social distancing always being available? from your standpoint as the, the, the maker, the innovator? Well, it, uh, you know, one of the questions I kept asking is when, the, when a child shows up and they don't have their mask, you know, letting it droop down, this is, it's a little bit maybe easier to enforce that this is up on your desk and you can see that it's up on the desk and if uh, someone's mask is drooping down or they're not keeping it up, you know, that is again, another level of um, barrier and, you know, I always in picture, too, you're sitting in class and you have people behind you and to the side of you, and you don't know what's going on back there. And so having this behind you uh, just gives you a little bit more peace of mind, too, as somebody in the back has a little sniffles, you don't have to worry about every time they do that. The goal, you would say, in a, in a few words, the goal of using this product is what? For me, one-on-one -on -one instruction. I'm not six feet away. I get three feet away. I get two feet away. I get one foot away. And I feel a little more comfortable doing it. Now, is it something that teachers would have a reason to put on their desk? Or only as long as the students have it? For me, I'd rather have the me go to the students than have them in a long line coming to me. Now, Chris, the, the education, um, the school districts that you have sold it to, is it a hard sell? No, it's been it's been really easy, and actually, the biggest one of the biggest things that came out of it is just you know connections, and then the power of social media, because Rod and and different relationships we had set up these tours, and different superintendents and principals would come through, and they immediately thought this this has a real application in my school, and most of the people who came through ended up buying something. And then Kathy put it out on her social, her Facebook page or one of these teacher groups and it just exploded. And, you know, now we're in selling into seven states, not just locally here in Northeast Ohio. And today I think we have 30 people downstairs making these. So it just exploded through connections. Pays for them when we hear that school districts are struggling, especially you know all precautions cost money, and they're struggling with additional needs to take precautions during the pandemic. Who pays for these? Does the school district pay? Do the parents pay? Who pays for them? Or is it different well, per school district? I've had some parents ask me for just like one or two, and the minimum order is twenty-five. So I said, go to your neighbors, get twenty-five, so you can order them that way. Um, my district unrealistically has not ordered them yet. So I'm ordering enough for two classrooms of mine so I can switch, switch them off in between classes. Um, and then just some districts, you have the CARES Act, they've gotten additional money. Okay. Yeah, so the CARES Act has helped a lot. And then we also had people call and they're buying them for a teacher um, in the classroom. So if the school is not doing it, this I know in Wisconsin this has happened a couple times, somebody's bought them on behalf of a teacher or a classroom. Now, this can help students be in person in school. So 
Kathy, perhaps you can speak to, you touched upon it, but perhaps you can speak a little bit more. You know, we know that schools provide education. I think one of the many, many things we've learned, parents in particular have learned to appreciate their teachers more when they had to homeschool. But I think that one thing we as a country have learned is that schools also provide meals and mental health resources and social connections and, and a safe place um, can you speak from your personal experience to some of the non-educational things that a shield that Chris's company makes can help keep in a kid's life? Well, for me personally, um, I have quite a few students in middle school that are suicidal and I am on their care list. And so when they feel like they're going to harm their, themselves, they reach out to me or when we're in school, the other teachers let them come down to my classroom. They need to see me. They need to have that. And, and sure, they can go to a counselor, but the counselors aren't always available. But when you're in school, almost every kid can find one teacher to connect with or the kids who are physically abused at home. We know that. And we turn them in, but they'll go back home. But when they can come to school, it's a little bit of safe time. So there be more. there are more kids like that than you know. And then just the food issue. Um, we're a hundred percent pre lunch in in we are ninety eight percent poverty, so that's huge. You know, Chris, you have an impressive list of clients from around the country. Um, in a non COVID time, that would be the story of this show. Okay, how this company in Northeast Ohio is dealing with um, has Disney as a client and Chico's and Bath and Body and Goodyear and Sheraton and PF Chang. That could be a story in itself. But does this? This kind of work, when you hear Kathy talk about what you know, on-site learning can mean, does this, is, does, is this fulfilling in a different way than your other business? Yeah, 100%, and in, in multiple ways. But you know, when you hear Kathy speak, you can understand why you have to listen because she's so passionate about kids and teaching, and uh, myself and most of the people in the company are very focused on education and uh, making sure that socialization piece that happens in your in your formative years um, but this has been just a ton of fun and so not only you know Kathy and another guy in our company Alan and I um, Rod spending many nights working on projects individually and then coming together the next day and Kathy uh, will deliver product to her and she'll sew things up and so it was a very grassroots organic fun thing to kind of put together rather than the traditional kind of corporate work we might do that uh, kind of flows from architects and construction companies down to us. So it's been a lot of fun that way. In the um, about two minutes I have left, I'm going to ask um, you for uh, some one or two word answers. Kathy, on a scale of one to 10, how tired of you are of Zoom meetings? Zoom? 10. <laughs> Chris? Yeah, I'm, I'm not, not a 10, but maybe an eight. Okay. Okay. What is one thing, one way of doing things that you think will stay with us, whether it's in the, in the business world or whether in education, that you think will stay with us after COVID, that we've changed for COVID that will stay with us? For me, I think it'll be staff meeting Zoom. Okay. Chris, is there something that you think has changed that will stay changed? Well, for our clients, um, a, lot of, a lot more barriers and separations in restaurants, we're doing a lot of stuff that's going to be permanent in structures, not just temporary structures. That's for a restaurant. Is there anything that you can think of that, at this point that as a society you think we will be forever different? Like, I would be happy if no one ever hand, does a handshake again. I was never a big fan to begin with. So if we never have handshakes again, I'd be okay. But is there a way that you think society will be forever changed? Yeah, I think that's one, but I think one of the things I hope that doesn't change is uh, that people still want to interact together and they still want to give each other hugs and, and be close to each other and that we don't become too distant. And that's the change that I hope doesn't happen. Kathy, besides the, the Zoom for staff, for the students, is there any way that you think education is going to be different permanently after COVID? Unfortunately, I think a lot of the subjects are going to go more and more digital. And that's always been my fear, is that we are too digital and we're losing the one-on-one. -on -one. The computer's grade, the computer's write back, the teacher response. 
the computer gets the student response. You lose the personal. The pandemic has had many horrible consequences. It has also inspired creativity. Our guest today joined us and joined together uh, to partner first in one particular school district with a manufacturing company and educators to keep its school doors open. Thank you to Superintendent Kim Redman, who, who left us early. Thank you to Chris Cargill, president of MRO Built. And thank you to Kathy Pugh, both for joining us today, an artist and our teacher, and for being one of the inspirations for this product. This is Leslie Unger. Thank you for joining us on Forum 60 for our global outlook with the local community. Forum 360 is brought to you by John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, the Akron Community Foundation, Hudson Community Television, the Rubber City Radio Group, Shaw Jewish Community Center of Akron, Blue Green, Electric Impulse Communications, and Forum 360 supporters.